Hello, welcome to our January 21st, 2022 Club Cubase live stream. I'm going to do a quick audio test to make sure everything is coming through fine. So bear with me just for a second and check my monitoring computer. Hello, welcome to our January 20th. Okay, everything sounds fine on my monitoring computer. Uh, my name is. Okay, so my name is Greg Undo. I am presenting today from uh, in the United States, just outside of Washington, D.C. area in Alexandria, Virginia. I work as a product specialist for Yamaha Corporation of America. Um, working, uh, prim my duties primarily focus on Steinberg products, and I'll be the host for the live stream today. If you have not attended a live stream before, how it works is... We can submit questions in the live chat field, or you could email questions in advance to clubcubase at steinberg.de, uh, especially if it's a little more involved. And then um, we'll try to get through all the questions that are asked today as completely and as succinctly as possible. When asking questions, if you could indicate which version of Cubase you have, LEAI, Elements, Artist Pro, which version, like 10, 10.5, 11, as well as which operating system that information would be helpful. Uh, my ability to answer questions in a real time manner with the actual uh, ch chat uh, will soon, uh, I won't be able to keep up in a real time manner. So there will be a delay from when I get the question to when I could get through them. Uh, so if we could try to avoid, if you don't see an immediate response to your question, if we could try to avoid asking the same question repeatedly, because that would just kind of slow everything down for me, <clears throat> that would be appreciated. Uh, we should have all of the topics covered in today's live stream with timestamps pinned in the comments field. So I'll be doing that later tonight. Uh, so you could jump immediately to a, a specific topic and read. So look in at the very top of the comments field. It will be pinned. If you wanted to search for uh, topics that have been covered in previous live streams, you could go to cubaseindex.com. And Jan from Stockholm has done a wonderful job of compiling that website for us. Uh, I also want to give special thanks to Agent K and to Jazz Dude, who do a wonderful job of volunteering their time. They're not Steinberg employees, but uh, to serve as moderators. So we give a special thanks to them, and we have a wonderful community here. Um, and also, if you're looking for a, an additional resource of information that's really pertinent and relevant to Steinberg uh, users and to the community, you could check out the Cubase Nation Discord in addition, obviously, to all the official Steinberg uh, channels. Uh, so with that, we, um, let's see if we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, and one last thing, if you're watching the live stream live, please feel free to introduce yourself and tell us where you're from. It's always a thrill seeing people from throughout the country. All right, so let's get started. Uh, so we have a question from Sir Robert. Um, let's see, just heard VST2 support is over. So it's, it's the VST2 support isn't over. Uh, what's happening is Steinberg announced that within two, uh, in two years, roughly, that, uh, that they probably won't be VST2 support going forward. Uh, so, you know, so it's still VST2 plugins are still going to work in Cubase 11 and Cubase 12, but they're giving a two year warning that after that, that it may not be, uh, working. And there's several different reasons, like different operating system architectures, you know, so there's a good chance that VST2 plugins, uh, like will never actually run on like an Apple M1 processor and perhaps future generations of processors. Uh, the VST3 plugin format has been out since 2008. So it's, you know, 14 years old now. We realize that some companies haven't switched, but a lot of companies uh, are already in the process that have held out already in the process of converting over to VST3. So I think within two years, it should be a seamless transition. We realize that there will be some companies that uh, may not, you know, ever come out with a VST3 plugin if they're out of business, but, you know, you can still run legacy 
versions of Cubase for compatibility in two years, if that's the case. Uh, but, you know, different elements of, you know, computer operating systems and chips evolve. And, you know, we can't necessarily, you know, like we don't support Windows 3.1 plugins or Windows 95 plugins anymore as well. So, you know, so it's kind of an evolutionary thing, but it's not an immediate thing. It's not taking place with Cubase 12. It's a two year warning. So, and Steinberg gave a three year warning that, you know, there were, you know, ceasing the VST2, you know, software development kit. So, you know, they're just giving everyone in a market a really uh, big heads up warning with that. So, uh, so VST2 support is not over. It's just in two years, we may not be supporting it within the DAWs, and they probably won't work at that time with different operating system and computer chip changes. Okay, so we have a question. Uh, I own a UR28M audio interface and love its versatility and features. Will there be an updated version of this product? Um, so I've seen some discussions of maybe something along those lines, but nothing concrete or nothing that could be announced. Um, there's obviously a huge demand for parts and components that aren't available for a lot of audio interfaces. So uh, for many audio interfaces in the market with the chip shortage and also uh, fires at companies like AKM, uh, who made a lot of computer or, or A to D and D to A converter chips, you know, their factory burned down. So that's put a lot of uh, holds for new audio interfaces from many companies kind of, you know, uh, on hold for new stuff. But uh, yeah, I'll make sure to reiterate that point. And we're glad you're liking your UR28M. I used to travel with one for years. Okay, so we have a question uh, from Ingrid. Uh, Hi, Greg. Could you please show us how to record multiple outs from Groove Agent into audio tracks? Thank you. Okay, so let's say I have um, just a quick pattern here, and I wanted to take. So let's say I have Groove Agent here, and currently these are all going to uh, a stereo output. So we could route through a group. Uh, and then the group as inputs. But something else that you could do that might be even faster is let's say if I have multiple outputs, I will just come to the top here and I will just say, okay, we're gonna send my kick to output two, my snare to output three, my hi-hats to output four, uh, let's say toms to output five, and let's say, okay, I want my overheads uh, to output six in my room to output seven. So once I have this routing uh, done within the plugin, so if I'm running it as an instrument track, probably the easiest way is once those settings are done is to come right over here and just go to edit to render in place. I could record it in real time, but this would probably actually just be faster. So I'll go to my render settings and we could choose to include, you know, different effects if we want it. So now when I click render, since this instrument is being rendered to uh, different audio tracks or different audio outputs to the mixer. If I did that right, let me just make sure I have the outputs. So it's usually kind of the render play. So I'll, I'll just try that one more time. So now that we have that selected, I can now have yeah, like my kicks, it's my snares, hi-hats, all kind of my toms, my overheads, and my room mics all kind of rendered. 
as individual files just that easily. So once you have uh, everything set up, just kind of select the track uh, and go to, you know, once you have the outputs and just do a render in place and that would render it. Uh, you could kind of do the same thing in real time, but render in place would probably make more sense and be even cleaner with that. Okay, uh, so we see Marcos Gomez on the live stream. So great to see you, Marcos. Uh, so it says, I have a question. I use ASIO for all since my monitors uh, have SPDIF thing, so I could free the UR22 to analog thing only uh, with a compressor, but it's generating noise from the inputs uh, even without use. Compressor even off and on levels down about UR22. The noise exists in a lot, what should I do? Um, so, you know, it could be a gain structure uh, issue. So also check to make sure like, you know, when you're doing the inputs uh, from the compressor, you might have to be careful because you could be going, if, I'm not sure if you're going quarter inch or XLR, but if you're going XLR inputs, you might be going into the microphone stage. Um, so you might be sending it into a, the microphone preamp when you want to do a line level. So make sure that you're also doing, um, you know, if you have the option to use the quarter inch inputs and outputs in UR22, that could help with that. Uh, and also I'm not sure if, you know, using the ASIO for all is not necessarily the most reliable drivers and especially when you're combining SPDIF uh, and if you're using SPDIF, make sure that you have the clocking set up between uh, your audio interface with the SPDIF connection and your monitors as well. All right, so we see Uno Memento from Finland and they have lots of snow and he will share it gladly with someone. So we were supposed to have a big snowstorm yesterday, but ended up just being rain, but school was still canceled for my son. So, so he had a cold, rainy day of virtual school at home. All right. All right, so we have uh, greetings from the United K uh, from London, United Kingdom. I have researched far and wide, and a definitive, comprehensive answer to my question. There seems to be different answers everywhere. Uh, ideally, the answer could be based on a mid-level system, fourth-generation i7, 16 gigs of RAM, and unless critical for this question, uh, we generalize all SSD similar, i.e., SATA, M2, NVMe, or similar. Um, says uh, Cubase one two three four five SSDs one big several small etc the price is as uh, no average that one to two terabytes is a sweet spot technically I could have one to two terabytes uh, with all files OS program samples and projects um, or is it better to separate these folders over several drives in the past SSDs were expensive um, but are not so much now. Uh, any advantages, disadvantages? Um, so currently, like, you know, there's lots of people running uh, in every live stream that I've done. I've done it from a laptop with a single drive. So I have a two terabyte SSD in my MacBook Pro and I have one terabyte partition for Mac OS and one for Windows. Um, so you're probably fine to do quite a bit, but you know if you're going to do 3,000 tracks of orchestral sampling, then you might want to split the you know the samples going to coming from a dedicated drive. You know if you're doing so, it's it's if we had a sense of you know if you're going to be a composer and you wanted to do kind of junky XL size templates then you could benefit from having dedicated SSDs. You know, the SSDs are just kind of ridiculously fast and inexpensive. I just recently got an M2 SSD drive for my personal computer just to expand uh, storage capabilities for some additional libraries. Um, but, you, you know, I would try maybe starting with one and then as your projects grow and you have your needs change or evolve, then add another one. But, you know, you could start with one and see exactly how it's working for you. But, you know, every project that I do in the live streams is coming from one single SSD in, in a, a laptop computer. So... 
All right, so we see that Benny got his reverence uh, convolution reverb to work. So he had some questions on previous live streams. Thanks for letting us know, Benny. Okay. All right, so we see a uh, question. Uh, as always, so my chat field just jumped on me. All right, so we see Jan in Stockholm. We have John Costigan from Kenosha, Wisconsin. And he's reminding people to uh, hit the like button. All right, we have Stefan from Sweden checking in. We have Trance 202020 from Berkshire, UK. And we have Detlef checking in from Dusseldorf. We have Luca from Germany. Okay, uh, so I see, hi Greg, I record MIDI in stacked mode where new parts are created every cycle. How can I make the last created part uh, not to play back after I press stop and start recording again? Okay, so let's say, um, I just have um, okay, so all right, so it just says, uh, how can I make the last creative part not to play back? So let's say if I do a cycle recording here, I'll just do a quick. Okay, so I hit cycle. So record, and say I'll do another higher note. So if you're in cycle mode, try coming over here and um, like you could put it into stacked mode. So as I want to come here, so I'll just go ahead and record low notes here. do like an octave up so we don't hear that as we so now that will mute the different notes so when we come over here so now when I play back it's just the last pass so try setting your MIDI record mode and you can do this to stacked um, and then at that point, your other MIDI recordings will still be there. Or if you just put it on replace, or if you choose to do new parts, we could have those kind of stacked. So just check your MIDI record modes directly there uh, from the transport. All right, so we see question, uh, why, why we can't buy the Cubase CC121 in Canada? So that was a product that was recently discontinued. So parts components were no longer available to manufacture it. So that's why it may not be available through dealers. Um, so that's, that's probably why. So, but there's a lot of people, uh, some dealers still have them. Uh, there's a number of dealers kind of got it towards the end of the year, kind of shipments on it. So, but there may be still some floating around. But there's a good chance that Yamaha Canada no longer has any in stock that they sold through everything. And some of the components are no longer available to purchase to manufacture it. All right, so we see Alexander from Moscow. Thanks for joining us. And we see David M. from Liverpool. All
All right, and we have Jola Media Productions from DeSoto, Texas. Okay, uh, so we just see one more question. On the preferences, display events, there is a setting, interpolate audio waveforms. This does nothing for the event waveform, only for the sample editor. So let's go ahead and take a look. Um, All right, so let's say if I have this. And let me just. Make sure I have the right preference. Okay, so say okay, so it's we have it here. So let me try to set this without uh, a bright color. So Just try maybe a new project and see if I can do it without colors. Let me show up differently without colors on it. Just try this without colors. You may see it a little better. Let's look at it in the sample editor. So I thought um, that that might be kind of tied to, you know, and it might be kind of like as we're down at the sample level, let's just, Yeah, I'm trying to remember what that preference does. I could do some, so let's see if we're here. I see, let's. Um, yeah, so I'm not sure what, what the pref, I, mean, I forgot what the preference was. I thought originally it might've been like the, uh, background color modulation, which would allow you to kind of see it waveforms, kind of the kind of the gradient intensity, like as we kind of look at it here. Um, but I could do some research, but I'm not sure if it's just that the in the sample editor that you get the dots, and maybe you don't get that in the main project window. Uh, but I could do some research on it. Um, sorry about that.
So it just says, uh, I thought this might change the waveform to look a bit better and not so spiky. Um, so, you know, I, I don't think, you know, it's just kind of this way, you know, I think like, you know, when you're doing most sample, uh, you know, sample editing, a lot of people would choose to do that in the sample editor here. So that, that why maybe why there's different, um, you know, different waveform perspectives there between the two different editors. All right, so we have Alexander Plasco checking in from Connecticut. All right, we have Matt checking in from London. All right, Daza Direct wants everyone to smash the like button, and that will allow us to continue to do these live streams. All right, and we have Nick checking in from Essex in the UK. Thanks for joining us. All right, uh, so we see from Sven Isaacson, I uh, just stumbled across something called Yamaha VST Rack Pro. What do you know about this? Uh, can it be used as an alternative to VE Pro 7 running VSTi plugins on a slave computer? So I believe if this is with the VST Rack, I'm not sure if it's a Yamaha product, but it's uh, with the RU i16. Uh, so what that's gonna allow you to do, it's really intended for live sound purposes. And what it allows you to do is with that particular audio interface, it's kind of like a USB to Dante audio interface. So if you needed to access particular plugins on like a large format console, you could connect that to your computer and run plugins through that. But I don't believe it's gonna be sending MIDI information over Dante. So it's just gonna be passing the audio. I don't have a license to check, but I don't believe that there's any provisions to send MIDI. It's intended for kind of audio processing so that within a Dante network, you could have access to VST plugins. So there's lots of people on like a large Rivage console that want to have access to their software plugins. And then they could just simply uh, use, you know, hook a, hook up a laptop to that with that interface. And then you could access and, you know, because those people on the large consoles, they want to use like the frequency and the Steinberg vintage compressor, uh, envelope shaper and some of those plugins. So I don't think it's intended to host a virtual instruments. I don't think that it will actually, uh, receive and, you know, MIDI information. So. All right, so we see Taylor from Pine Grove, uh, Pennsylvania. Okay, so we have a question. Uh, could you show us how the input transformer works? So when we want to work with the input transformer, we could come over here, and this is going to allow us to change or alter incoming MIDI data. So let's say if I am, I want to come here, and I will start off with, um, let's say, just like a Rhodes part. Okay, so let's say I only want, and we could access this through the inspector here. We see this little squiggly line, and we could have this set up globally or locally for a particular channel. So we could activate a module. And here I could say, I just wanted to take notes um, and let's say I wanted to transpose notes uh, to a particular scale. So many times people may, uh, typical use, okay, like I wanted to uh, take notes, like incoming note messages, and I wanted to subtract value one to pitch by 12. So now every time that I play a particular note, it would subtract as soon as this is turned on. We could just take the incoming MIDI notes and then transpose it down. So as soon as I would play a particular note, we could transpose it. We could also say if I want it, if my orchestral library, uh, and I'll just indicate this with uh, 
my MIDI monitor here. So let's say I have my mod wheel, but my string library responds to uh, an expression MIDI message. So what I need to do if I wanted to turn my mod wheel into a, you know, from CC1 to CC11, what is the expression? I'm going to say, we're going to say type is equal to uh, control change. So we'll just say controller. And we want it to take, let's say, and if I wanted to take value one of that controller is controller one. And what I want to do to that is add 10. So I want to take controller one and turn it into controller 11. So at this point, we could now just come over here and transform. So now as soon as this is on, I move my modulation wheel. It's controller 11. I turn this off. It's controller one. So it allows us to take incoming MIDI information and also just kind of transform it to do different things. People also use it if you had a, a multi, like if you're playing multiple instruments and you wanted to play MIDI controller and only have a particular MIDI channel going to a particular track, there's also channel filtering. So I could say I wanted to only want to filter out everything on this track except MIDI channel one from a controller. Or I my controller and has a pitch bend wheel and a modulation wheel that are broken. And every time I use my modulation wheel, the pitch bend uh, you know, randomly sets. So I could come over here and just say we wanted to filter out, you know, aftertouch, filter out pitch bend. So we could do different, you know, so it's gonna take incoming MIDI data, modify it, transform it. So on input, so that we could use it a little more creatively with our controllers for different situations. All right, uh, so we see a question from Taylor. Uh, is supervision best positioned in a control room on the stereo out or on the stereo out bus? Is there an advantage of one over the other? So I generally run the, you know, what I do personally is, you know, I run it on uh, my, my control room uh, output. So, but, you know, since it's not really modifying the sound, uh, I don't think it's terribly critical between the two. So as we come over here, we could just say, okay, I want it to now you know, take this and, you know, so there's not really an advantage. Some people, I've seen some people that will use 16 inserts on their master bus, and maybe they want to still have the uh, capability of running uh, the supervision. There's no real advantage because it's not processing the sound. So sometimes we may want to decouple the monitoring signal path, like for room correction, so that's not applied into the mix console, but just on a monitoring path. And that's why we would do it on the control room for something like Sonarworks or like a room correction type plugin. But it, there's really no disadvantage to run supervision as a, as a metering plugin on either the contr uh, control room or the main stereo out. All right, hang on. My son is uh, home today from school for a school work day. Hang on just one second. All right, apologize for the interruption. All 
Okay, so we have another question from Taylor. Uh, is it possible to send a snare from Groove Agent to an effects channel outside of Groove Agent SE without dissolving the drum part? So yeah. So let's say if I'm here and I wanted to use like maybe a different a, a reverb on my snare. So let me just revert this quickly. So, you know, we have 32 stereo outputs inside of Groove Agent. So let's say if we have this open, so, and I'll show you on an acoustic agent as well as um, a beat agent kit. So let's say I have my snare here. So as we play, I can say I want to take my snare and let's send this to output two. So now that I'm here on output two, I could just say, now I wanted to run it through, let's say just Roomworks Reverb. So we didn't dissolve the kit, but all we did was literally just take that particular sound to a different output. And if it's a beat agent kit, it's the routing is handled a little differently. So if I wanted to look at a, a beat agent kit, just a mixer is laid out differently. We would see when we go to the main tab, at this point, we could just send, uh, we could select a pad and send it out to a bus. That's a different output in the VST mixer. And then we could just do whatever processing we want. So this snare would be on its own dedicated output, but still all the MIDI data is on one track. All right, thanks for all the great questions. All right, we have Los Angeles checking in. All right, so we have Stephen Bowler checking in, uh, just saying, hi, question is, uh, hi, Greg, thank for this one, thanks for this wonderful resource. Uh, having inserted some automation on a track, is it possible to adjust the overall level of that track, including the dynamics? Thanks. Um, so there's, there's a couple ways. So let's say if I have an audio file, here, and let's say if we have automation, you know, so if I wanted to, let's say if I love the automation and I wanted to overall boost all of the levels, we could select all the automation points here. Uh, and if we go to the center, we could raise and lower your different parts just like that. If we go to the particular channel, there's also, if you go to the, like the EQ, we can see the pre-gain. So this would uh, occur before the signal hits the channel. So we could, you know, add 48 uh, dB of gain directly there. So it would still maintain our automation as we do there. Um, you could also, if you wanted to not affect the automation, but make the audio louder, you could do clip gain just by grabbing the upper center portion of the audio event. So you could do it directly there. One other method is to send that track to like a group or a VCA. So if I now have this going to a VCA, I could increase the gain here. And that would still maintain my automation, but I could increase and decrease the level of the particular tracks. So there's four or five ways to kind of do that. Um, but yeah, it's pretty easy to do.
All right, so we see um, it's just a question. Uh, do you know what I can use to get the sound from Cubase to go through OBS so I can stream my sessions because I tried to restream, but it just isn't working correctly? What can I do? So, you know, if depending on your audio interface, um, so like if you have a UR interface, you could come directly over to, let's say if I come over here to applications, um, So I'll come over here to my DSP mix effects URC. And then there is a loopback function. So your audio interface may have a loopback function that you could enable. Uh, what I do, because I always had problems uh, in, you know, before there was loopback and it's just the system that I have is again, I use a separate uh, USB mixer for the live stream that's independent of my Cubase audio interface. So the audio out from uh, Cubase goes directly into, uh, from my Cubase audio interface into the mixer with my microphone. And that's what OBS is using for my setup. So I just use kind of two separate audio interfaces and you know, just a, a system I set up years ago and I just kind of have kept it. I could probably streamline it but you know it's because often obs isn't smart enough to use asio um so but depending on your audio interface it may have different loopback functions i think there's also voice meter if you're on uh pc where you could do routing and stuff like that so um but that's kind of what i use and it's i don't have to worry about setting up an audio in like an audio track for an input to monitor my microphone I could change sample rates without any issues. So that's how I have mine set up. All right, so we have Steve McCormick checking in from Buffalo. Thanks for joining us. All right, and we have Steve from UK in Manchester. All right, so you just see a question. Uh, is there any way to make the waveform more solid in Vario Audio uh, edition panel, like an audio warp window, but inside Vario Audio would be easier to free warp uh, and Vario Audio at the same time? So I don't think it's adjustable, uh, but we'll go ahead and take a look just to show people. So let's say for so we you know we have the waveform you know kind of demure because most of the people are going to be kind of doing the edit uh, you know so yeah as you're doing kind of warping. Um, so you can see the waveform. I'll pass that along as kind of a feature request because you might as well be able to kind of edit to the grid and make it a little more obvious. Um, but one of the things you could also do is just from the waveform, you could you know take it to the point where you're actually um, you know could have the 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 segments above the waveform. But I'll I'll make sure to pass that along as a feature request for that. It makes sense. All right, so we have a question. Um, started using Dorco lately. Is there a link to export score from Cubase to Dorco or the other way around? You know, so with Dorco 4, one of the great things is, you know, I think, you know, it's one of the things that we're, we'll see uh, in development now is kind of having more interoperability between the two programs. You know, and we didn't want to necessarily hinder the development of Dorco. 
so, but Dorco will do a great job. You could take a MIDI part and just drag and drop it, like a MIDI event, and drag and drop it directly into Dorco, uh, like into the play mode, um, and that will automatically populate. You could do uh, exporting music XML or MIDI files, and a lot of people now will, you know, have created you know extensive templates within Cubase. So Dorco is, you know, when you export a MIDI file, you can say, you know, these, you know, thirteen violin tracks, you know, uh, that are all of my different articulations or different libraries. When we import the MIDI file, should go directly. Uh, you know, as the MIDI file is imported, I want to take these 13 tracks with these names and put these all into violin one. This, the, all these tracks would import directly into one MIDI track of violin two on another. So it's not necessarily Cubase specific, you know, which is good, but I think we'll see more uh, operations, you know, of integration in, in the future, maybe the next rev of different programs, perhaps, uh, I know it's kind of in a discussion as we speak. So, but right now it's going to be standard MIDI files, which works very well, or music XML. If you've done a lot of layout and scoring, you could get back and forth. But probably MIDI files would be a, a better way to get your data over. Okay, so we see from David M. Uh, Hi, Greg. I bought the Howian Symphonic Orchestra. I'm clicking into VST instrument and plugins. And download assistance, I can only see uh, Howian SE 3.5 for download. Can you help me with this download, please? So what happens when you have the uh, Howian Symphonic Orchestra is it's a sound set. So it will now, once you go to loaded, you know, like the very first version, you know, 15 years ago would... Uh, load up as a standalone instrument, but it was basically running in its own little Halion player. So if you go to Halion Sonic SE uh, and you click on the load, you'll see kind of uh, like your library, all your libraries here. So now we could say, we'll see HSO, and this is all the Halion Symphonic Orchestra. So now I can say, okay, I want it to have my trombone and I could play this particular patch. So, um, and that's where you would open it up. So, you know, try going to load. And once you have the, the sound set downloaded, it's not a standalone program, but it's a plugin that could work inside of Halion Sonic SE, Halion Sonic, or Halion. So you'll just see it as HSO directly there. So give that a try, David. All right, so I just see uh, why Greg skipped my question. Let me see if I could find it, sorry. Just scroll back. Just looking for a question, make sure I didn't skip it. Was it intentional? Sorry. Okay, so this is uh, from Javonovic 3D. Says, uh, why Greg skipped my question? So I didn't see it. I just kind of scrolled back and I didn't see the question. But if you want to just ask it again, I'm sorry about that. Uh, I'd be happy to kind of to answer for you. Sorry about that. All right, we see Brian Sawyer from Beulahville, North Carolina. And we have Darcy checking in from UK. All right, and we have... Jeffrey from the UK. All 
All right. Uh, so we just see um, why isn't the gain control in the mixer, for example, above the fader? So um, it's actually I I kind of passed this on as feedback before. So um, but if you go to the mixer here, um, so say if we're in like the full scale mixer. And if we look at the racks here, we can see the pre. So here the gain, you know, we see kind of the you know, the typical signal flow. Uh, but I've mentioned it before, it'd be nice to have the capability of having the gain and phase reverse right around on top of the mixer. Uh, but I'll pass that along again as a feature request. Um, so. I, All right, so we see Michael Teens on the live stream from Weatherford, Texas. All right, and we have uh, Gamera21 checking in from Berlin, just saying thank you a lot for your ongoing support with these streams, Greg. So you're welcome. All right. through all right so we have terrence checking in from atlanta thanks for joining okay uh so we see uh from gregory uh this may be a follow-up to our previous question we we're discussing again to my question about cycle midi recording i mean how can i make the last created part not to play back after i press stop and start recording again all right so let me just set up quick cycle Okay, so let's say if I Okay, so how can I make the last created part not uh, to play back after I press stop and start recording again? All right, so we'll just try so I'll play low notes again. See if I maybe on external sync or something. Yeah, all right. Okay, so so I'm just gonna look at my MIDI record mode. All right, so I just put that into replace. So now. So I stop and I'll play up an octave. So, you know, depending on, you know, check your MIDI record mode. So let me know, like I just put it in replace. And if you wanted to do that, or if you wanted to do New parts, so let's see what happens if I do the new parts. So if you're not doing stack mode, you know, you could mute the event if you wanted to mute. Um, but if you just have it on replace, that other one um, will not play back.
All right. Uh, so we have uh, another question, if I may. Uh, what's the best way to set up Vary Audio when working with audio not recorded at concert A440? All right. So, you know, what a lot of people, you know, what I what a lot of people will do is I'm just going to change one preference here quickly. Put a background color modulation. You know, if you, let's say if it was recorded at A, you know, 432, is you could actually just come over here to the audio. And if you just adjust the fine tuning, so say, okay, you know, if it was recorded at 432, I think we would add eight here. And then all the changes that we make uh, would, you know, basically be offset by the tuning adjustment. So you could just do the fine tuning here and then just apply it and and then once you have that matched up to whatever tuning you have at that point as you do the tuning it would correlate to the to the tuning so let's say if it was at 432 you know you you would just kind of adjust a fine tune and that would adjust it by sense and then you could just simply uh you know do the edits and have it snap to pitch Okay, uh, so we see uh, from Helmet, it uh, says, Hi, Greg, uh, Austria is watching. So thanks. It says, uh, when tuning vocals in Vary Audio, the algorithm switches to standard solo. How can I use Elastic Pro or some better sounding algorithm? So, you know, the standard solo algorithm is actually what's used to do all of the pitch detection and segment detection. So it's going to be tied directly into that. So I think even if it was set to Elastic Pro, it, you know, it, you know, from what I heard, it won't make necessarily, uh, uh, a, you know, a, a, you know, a difference audibly in the audio. But you know, the it's not just for the playback, but it's also how what Vary Audio is based on for all of the detection and segmentation of the audio itself. So that's why when you do Vary Audio, it is in standard solo mode. Michael Teams wants people to whack the like button. Okay, so we see from Daza Direct says, I've uh, been offered a spare legit new Nuendo Live for 42 pounds. This or upgrade my Cubase 11 LE to Elements. Uh, same for 42 pounds or towards Cubase or save towards Cubase 12 artist. You know, if you were just doing live capture, you know, Nuendo Live is a perfect solution. Like I'm a live sound front of house mix engineer and I want to hit one button and uh, be able to track. But if you wanted to do editing, you're better off probably, and you want to run plugins, you're better off going to, you know, Cubase Artist or Cubase Elements. Um, so, you know, realize that Nuendo Live, you can't really run any plugins or do, like do extensive editing, so. Okay, just see a comment that maybe it'd be better to do two hours of live stream instead of four because it's just too long. So if we try to you know answer as many questions, so if we have two hours of questions, we'll answer two hours of questions. Uh, but you know people could always just easily just kind of jump back uh, and watch it afterwards. So if you watch two hours today, two hours tomorrow, you know you could do it like that, but.
Okay, uh, so you see, how can I question? Uh, how can I continue to monitor, monitor incoming instrument audio uh, when recording loops? Right now, I have to turn off the monitor to hear the first loop of the track. Want to hear it while record more tracks? Um, Okay, so just okay. So you see, uh, I'm just trying to understand a workflow here. How can I continue to monitor incoming instrument audio when recording loops? Uh, right now, I have to turn off the monitor off to hear the first loop of the track. Uh, Want to hear it while recording more tracks? Okay, so you know, if you're constantly, you know, we could think that the audio source is going to play back. Um, if it's something like, okay, I want it to, if you wanted to monitor, like, you know, kind of almost like a looping scenario, like, like what a, like a guitar looper would do. So, you know, if you wanted to take, you know, this particular. Let me just set it in for. Okay, so you know, as we record audio in, you know, we could just come here. Um, but you know, what I would do, I'm just set it up in a loop. So I would just, you know, be recording in this. And you know, we think of it. It's going to one track is going to play back one source. You know, set up multiple tracks, and then you can just go down. You know, and you have a foot switch that just okay. I want to go down to the next track. And I want to go down to the next track. And I want to go down to the next track. And at, at this point, these are all separate files. So if you need to hear the existing audio recording, you know, while you're doing the new loop, you know, you could just set it up like this and just, you know, hit the down arrow button. And then you could hear all the audio. Uh, you know, otherwise, you know, it could be problematic hearing, you know, multiple tracks simultaneously on one audio track how do you adjust the volume of those you know when you have a channel fader that's global um so it gets to be problematic um and you know for organization stuff so you know try just setting up multiple tracks and then just you know hit the down uh arrow button All right, so we just see a question, how long until Cubase 12? Um, so, you know, they haven't announced anything other than it's coming. So can't really share any more information. I wish I could. I have a lot of northern German people mad at me. So. Okay, so we have a question. Uh, would like to know what is the difference between the effects in the control room and uh, who who to use them in a mix or routing? Thanks. Okay, so a lot of times, you know, we have people that may have uh, like a project. So let's say I'm here, and let's say I my room isn't you know professionally set up, and I'm running a room correction plugin to compensate for deficiencies in my studio like the sonic deficiencies of the physical room so people could would often come over here and they would you know kind of run a test signal of the room with the microphone and it would be like an eq and, and the eq may be something that looks like this and this would make your room sound flat so we go okay now if i put this on my master fader my room sounds correct. So let's say this is, you know, room correction plugin number one. 
All right, and so we'll call it RC1. So this is what it takes to make my room sound good. But so I could put on my master fader, but then what happens is if I don't turn that off and I go to export my mix down, this plugin with my room correction EQ, which is supposed to make my room sound flat, now my exported audio mix down is processed through this EQ and then makes the mix down file sound weird to everyone else. So at this point, this is when it makes sense to put in a, an effect like that in the control room because the control room, when we export audio mix down, this is just monitoring path. So the control room is not included when we do an export audio mix down. So this is why it's often used for doing like room correction, uh, and stuff that's not necessarily intended to be in the audio file, but in the monitoring path instead. All right, I'll just turn off my lovely EQ, destroy my great Fred Corey project. All right, uh, so we see Greg, uh, question. If I copy all notes on a track to another track, is there a fast way to delete all notes just leaving the bottom notes to use as base notes? Okay. Let's take a look. I think we can do this through the logical editor. Just revert this quickly. Thanks for all the wonderful questions. All right, so let's say. I'll just populate some chords here quickly. Okay. All right, so let's say if I have now taken these and I'll just drag them and I'll glue these together. Okay, so let's say if I wanted to uh, leave only, just leaving the bottom bass notes. All right, so let's say, I'll just make this large. Okay, so let's take a look at our logical editor. Um, so let's just say we want to delete. Type is equal to note. Uh, we will choose, let's say maybe unequal to note. Let's try this and we'll say our context variable. Um, All right, so we'll say lowest note in chord zero. So, so what I did is we under function delete, um, and we want to say type is unequal to the lowest note zero. So let's see if I did this right. And see if that. All right. 
right? So let me just, all right, so we'll say is unequal to, and we'll say position in chord. We'll say note number in chord. So you could give that a try. So again, I'll just come over here. Um, so this way we could delete everything that's not the lowest note in the chord. So again, we will choose function delete. Type is equal to note. Context variable unequal to note number zero. Note number in chord zero. So this will say anything that's not the lowest note in the chord. That's a note delete. So I'll just come right over here. And you could also, if we choose to, let's say, uh, extract, you could also just kind of come over here. Um, so let's say if I wanted to So if I do this and say, okay, apply. So you could also extract, but just try again, uh, unequal, delete from the, your copied part, and we'll set it to the note position in a chord of being zero. So when we run this again now, That'll just leave the base notes for you. So give that a try. All right, so we have Jason checking in from South Shields, England. All right, so we see Steve Leeds from San Francisco Bay Area, and also I saw Sable Winters on from, from San Francisco, Oakland area, so. Thanks for being a part. And we have Brianna from Youngstown, Ohio. Thanks for joining us today. Okay, so I just see uh, from Michael Teams. Uh, howdy, Greg. Uh, could you please walk through setup of the control room? Again, please, mine dropped out. And now that I have it back, some of my tracks do not show up at the Aviom headphone remotes. So if you're dealing with the headphone remotes, probably what you need to do is to come over here. Let's go to your audio connections and you'll see that you'll have um, the ability of adding uh, different cue mixes. So let's say I wanted this to be my cue mix for drums And I'll add in our cue mix, let's say for vocals. If I could type, I'd be okay. And once we have our cue mixes, and we'll see these with the stars, that we could now tell it where to connect to on your audio outputs that would feed your Aviom system. So again, right click and you'll see like your cue mixes. Um, and if you have all the cues, you may not see that, but you would see like the little star here. And that indicates that that's a, like a headphone or cue mix. So at this point, we could now set up your different cue mixes right here and define what outputs are from your audio interface or converter are then feeding into your Aviom system. All right, so we have Tim from Mission Viejo, California. Thanks for joining us today. Okay, so what is a quick way to render a third-party synth VST uh, track into a new track? It's really, you know, just, uh, I'm not sure if I let me have one third-party, but it's treated the same way, whether it's... Uh,
So let's say I have a towel synth here. Okay, just a little third party plugin. So now if I just wanted to select the event or the track, uh, go to edit to render in place. And we have different options we could do as one event. We could include, you know, channel settings, different effects. You could add the tail size. Uh, you could give it a custom name. But if you just click on render, at that point, it's going to create the audio track directly below. And we've now turned that into uh, your audio track from the synth. And we had it automatically mute the, the part there as well. So we can just... Once again, just go to your edit menu to render in place, so. Okay, so we have a question from uh, uh, John Costigan um, says, uh, hello, Greg. I hope you and yours are well. Cubase 11, 041, Windows 10. Uh, what is the best practice to change overwrite uh, the volume automation levels once they've been set? So I'll just come over here to... All right, so let's say we have this is our active project. And I'll say I'll just solo the bass here. All right, and let's say I have existing automation going on here. Okay, so let's say now I, I don't like that. So if we're in touch automation mode, um, anytime that I just grab the fader now, I'm in right, it will keep the automation until I let go. Then it'll go back to the existing automation. Now, sometimes you may want it to not, and that's like physically touching a fader. Now there's also kind of auto latch, where if I say, okay, I'm just kind of looking for the levels. I can say, okay, this is where my level should be. And I'll let go of the fader and it'll still continue to write that value until I stop. So that I don't have to physically touch the fader. So now when I come here and I stop, will be exactly kind of where we were. So try that, you know, so just coming over here uh, and, you know, just what, if you wanted to replace the whole thing, you could also go into, like if you wanted to start from scratch, um, you know, you could just say, uh, I want to write to start and to end. So while I'm playing, so now if I adjust this, So whatever I left it at will then write an automation point at the beginning and at the end of the project and get rid of all of the other existing automation. So that's another option by hitting F6 and going to the automation panel of to start and to end. All right, so I think it's Alexander just mentioned his question got deleted twice. Um, and he had a question about MIDI modifiers. So I, I, I didn't delete it, uh, but you know, Alexander, if you want to email me uh, at clubcubase at steinberg.de, uh, I, I could probably catch it in my email. So if, if for some reason it's getting flagged by YouTube or something for some unknown reason, uh, but I apologize that it's happened to you. It doesn't...
All right. Uh, so we see, speaking of Dorco, contact player doesn't launch in the orchestral tool. Sign player does not appear. Also, can the list of instruments be organized by manufacturers or category uh, of or custom sort? Um, so it could be that you might have to, depending on the versions that you're running, you might have to run those under Rosetta uh, if you're running on an M1 Mac. So I'm not sure if you're running on an M1 Mac or not. Uh, I know that in Cubase, um, we'll take a quick look at Dorco. I think I have four on. Just make sure. So, you know, some of the, uh, if it's, you know, some of the plugins, if you're running on Mac with an M1 processor, you might have to uh, tell that particular plugin to run under Rosetta. I know that we could kind of switch the manufacturers and uh, by, you know, plugin category, plugin type, or manufacturing Cubase. I'll take a quick look at. Uh, Dorco here. Okay, so. So I'm not sure if there's um, a way I could do some more research to. I mean, looks. I'm not sure if there's a plugin manager or if it's maybe handled uh, directly within your playback templates within Dorico. Um, so, but I, I could check with you if you want to email me at uh, clubcubase at steinberg.de. And you can also check out uh, the, the Discover Dorco sessions as well. So we just see Daza, Daza Direct just saying, uh, Cubase Artist looks amazing. I've been saving for spectral layers, but I'm thinking if uh, of elements and dive into Cubase Artist uh, as it has spectral layers and so much more. So yeah, Artist is a, a pretty amazing deal and you get to spectral layers one with it as well. All right, so we have Dan Freeman checking in from Atlanta. Thanks for joining us. And we have Al from the Bronx. All right, we have Nikolai or Nikolai checking in from Bulgaria. Thanks for being a part of the community today. Okay, so I see maybe the question. Um, okay, from Alexander that got deleted. Uh, is it possible to record MIDI from another MIDI? For example, I use MIDI modifiers and MIDI inserts for generate some melody in scale. Um, so let's come over here and give it a shot. Everyone's looking for Cubase 12 here in my folder, probably. All right. Um, all right. Didn't like me adding that today. OK, 
Okay, so let's take a look. Um, let's make sure I have audio. Okay, so all right, so uh, it says I use MIDI modifiers and MIDI inserts uh, to generate some melody in scale. So let's say come over here to my MIDI inserts and we'll get to MIDI modifiers. Okay, so let's say I want this only to be in B major. Okay, so if you want, um, so to possible to record the MIDI from another MIDI, for example, I use MIDI modifiers and MIDI inserts to generate some melody and scale. It always plays random notes, so how can I render them to the MIDI? I know it's possible to render to audio, but I need the MIDI. So if you click on this little icon here, now as I would play back like a C major scale, let's say. So now as I look at this, um, the notes I've recorded are only going to be in, so you know, everything that was in, you know, when we look at the notes here, it's going to be in the key of B major as we, so I hit a C major here, but it automatically modified that to the scale. So uh, at that point, if I want it to, you know, record the changes from that, all you have to do is again, come over here in the MIDI modifiers is just set up uh, the record output to track and then it will take your incoming MIDI data and then just record that. Uh, so that's rendering the MIDI. If you don't have that turned on, so let's say I'll do the same thing and I'll have it, uh, I'm gonna have it set for B major but I'm gonna play a C major scale. So it'll modify it. But now the actual notes here will be in C major. So when we look at the notes, we'll see that you know this note is C major, but it's gonna play back through those MIDI modifiers. But if I wanted to change it after the fact, this is when we go to freeze MIDI modifiers. And then once we do freeze MIDI modifiers, the, uh, the MIDI modifier uh, preset that you had here in the transformer has now been applied and kind of rendered to the part and changed the MIDI data. So we'll, once I come over here, we'll undo. So let's say if I'm here and we'll say, okay, we undo, now we're in C major, now we're in B major. So. So you could record directly there, but if not, go to MIDI to freeze MIDI modifiers. Uh, so we see, please, how do I connect uh, FL to Cubase? So I think you could run it as a VST3 plugin or through Rewire and just kind of have it be a Rewire uh, have it synchronized that way. Okay, so we see David M just saying, uh, just checked HSO not shown in Halion SE. Uh, Halion updated to the latest version from the download assistant, uh, so that did not work. So let me just open up the download assistant.
Okay, so you know you should have this uh, file here, the Hallian Symphonic Orchestra. Um, once you, you you could see where that file has been downloaded to, so you could say your target folder. Uh, you could have it go there, but you know if you see this particular file, what you need to do, and it'll be a .vst preset. Um, so wherever you do is just double click on that. Uh, or right click on it and that will open it in the Steinberg library manager and make the association so that Halion knows to look for that particular content library. But make sure A, that you have this downloaded. And then once you download it, you'll probably see um, like a .vst uh, sound file and just double click on that and that will make the association automatically with the Steinberg Library Manager. And this will now kind of keep track of all your content. So if I come over here, you can say, okay, I wanna to go to Halion, and then you should see kind of your, you know, Halion Symphony, Symphonic Orchestra, just right there. So you could also just kind of, you know, just go directly to, see if you see it in your Steinberg Library Manager, but if not, just wherever you downloaded that to or installed it to, double click and that will automatically take that VST sound preset and make the association so that it's available in Halion for you. Okay, going through my chat field jumped on me. All right, so I think I'm. Okay, so we see, uh, hey, is there a way to render in place an audio track with insert plugins being printed, but keep the send automation? So yeah. So let's say I will. So when we do a render in place, let's say I'll do just kind of a nasty EQ on my vocal here as an insert. Just revert this quickly, or I'll just get a project that'll load up a little faster to show. Just check my audio connections here real quick. Sorry about this. Okay, so let's say. So I'll take the bass part here and let's say I want to. say I want to include this EQ and let's say a flanger so I'll come over here we'll do something just obvious sounding let's do a chopper that'd be fun Okay, and but I want it to add a send. 
of reverb. Okay, so now. All right, so, and I'll do just a small section of it. So we want to render like the inserts, uh, but not the sends. So all you have to do is select the event here. Let's go to your render in place and we'll go to render settings. And when we say complete signal path, this includes the sends. When we say channel settings, this is EQs, channel strip and inserts. So I'll say render. So now as we do this, we could have everything just kind of rendered uh, directly in place. Let me, I think I had it selected, sorry about that. Just... So that's all you'd have to do with that. So. Again, just come over here, and when you do the render in place, just include the channel settings, but not the complete signal path. That adds the send effects, the complete signal path, and master effects adds the send effects plus the master processing on a particular channel. All right, we see Jeff Sabelski checking out from checking in from Chico, California. Thanks for joining us today. Okay. We see Soren has joined us. He was in the deep dive working on a song, so glad you can make the live stream. All right, uh, so we just see, how can I set a VST instrument to be mono? I Now I have to create a mono group and route it to that one if I want mono. So it, it really depends on the instrument. Uh, so most, the vast majority of instruments will be set up for stereo, uh, but instruments can be set up for stereo and mono or 5.1. So it's really up to the instrument, but if the instrument itself is designed to output stereo, then you'd need to route it to a mono group. Okay, so just see a question from Chris Hallam. Uh, it says, Greg, I noticed the older separate Club Cubase YouTube channel. Did you always run these while working for Yamaha or is that an old channel that you run on your own? So I used to do that. Um, when I started the live streams, I, I would just put up tutorials on the on the Club Cubase YouTube channel. Um, and then we, you know, when we started doing live streams, we would do it there. Uh, and then Steinberg says, uh, you know, hey, why don't you just let us, you know, we could, you know, instead of having your resources there, we'll just have you do all of the resources for us. So, um, so we, I stopped putting my tutorials and my live streams on the Club Cubase channel, and now it's all kind of centralized on the uh, Steinberg YouTube channel. So, you know, I, I represented Steinberg for almost 30 years now. So I, I did that when, you know, as a Yamaha employee, but it was just my own personal YouTube channel that I did, maybe a proof of concept. And I would, in the early days, I would share tutorials, uh, you know, on that site and the Steinberg site, but there's kind of, Steinberg did a, a wonderful kind of consolidation and a real focus on their YouTube channel. So I just agreed to provide all my content for the official Steinberg channels just to make it easier for everyone. So. Okay, uh, so we have a question. Can you please demonstrate Step Designer and its uses? Okay, so let's take a look at it. 
So I think it, you know, we could think of it as like almost like a little tiny sequencer uh, as a MIDI plugin. So let's say if I want it to come over here and just load up like a synth bass type of sound. Okay, so let's say I wanted to, uh, we'll go to the MIDI tracker. We're gonna run this as a MIDI insert effect. So we'll just now come over here to our step designer. And you could always kind of start off with different presets. So let's say I just wanted to have, um, you know, some different, So now kind of as I would play back, you know, this, I play one note. So I could just have this kind of step sequencer, just kind of generating ideas. And then you could have different patterns. You could say, okay, I wanted this to be velocity. You can just kind of come right over here and just kind of enter in. And then if you wanted to randomize. So you could just kind of start off and you know, but all sorts of So as soon as you just kind of play, you could have kind of a little, almost like a little step sequencer that people often are spending a lot of money on. You could just kind of turn it on and have that kind of synchronize and you could change different scenes and stuff like that. Okay, so we have a question. Um, hi, I'm using the sizer tool to cut uh, MIDI notes. It still remains in the same length. Uh, so what exactly do for the same? Um, so I, I think it's maybe if I'm understanding So if it's like I have a MIDI note here uh, and I cut, and I'll just throw in just some. So let's say now, if I select this event and I split it, um, all right. So I'm just rereading. So MIDI notes should still remain in the same length. So if you come over here and split, now, when I split the part, we can see that the MIDI notes are now separated. Um, so if you if you want it to be separated, so now that they're one part, so if I apply a split here, we can notice that that split that I applied on the event will split the MIDI notes and create a note off and note on message. And this, if this is what your question's about, this is just a preference. So if we go to your Cubase preference here and we say editing, I think it's under uh, MIDI, you could say split MIDI events. So if that is unchecked, I can now split my MIDI event 
and these the notes aren't affected. Uh, but with that preference enabled, again, under editing, MIDI, split MIDI events, and we do the same idea for controllers as well. So now when I split, um, you know, that will automatically just split the particular notes for you. So give that a try, just that one preference. Okay, so we have a question. Um, so it says, uh, how can I export uh, master instrumental and instrumental with backing tracks at once in Cubase 11? Okay. So let's go ahead and Come over here, so I'll revert this. Okay, so let's say if I had, um, let's say this was, I wanted to do like, I think it's an instrumental and instrumental with vocals. Uh, so what a lot of people do is, um, let me just see if I have, I, I can do it in our project here quickly. So if you're doing kind of like, you know, TV mixes. Let me just look for a quick project that I could do it. All right, so what I know a lot of people do is, you know, take everything and you may have to set up like a template for this, but let's take everything here. I'll select all my tracks and what I want to do is add a group track to those and we'll call this, you know, all. And let's say I wanted to now have all of the instruments. All right, so let's say we're up to here with all of our instruments. Okay, and I'm going to, so we have our group channel here, all tracks. I'm gonna add another group channel. And we'll call this um, instruments only. Okay, so we have one that's gonna be, so now what I want to do is to select all my instrument tracks here and we could send it to, our instruments only group. So I will come here, let's go to our sends and I'll hold down alt shift and we'll send these all to instrument only and set it all to zero db so we, once you have that set up once you can now go to export audio mixdown, and we could say 
okay, I want to export multiple. And I can say, let's export all tracks and let's export instruments only. And that way you could uh, have multiple different combinations of export tracks at once. So give that a shot. Okay, so to see uh, question part one, uh, when I'm creating a song just from Soren, uh, I might drag out a Groove Agent MIDI event to the Groove Agent track for that selection for that section of the song. But then I have second thought, and I might want to switch it uh, with another Groove Agent, um, another Groove Agent MIDI part. Can I audition an alternative, easy way in some way? Uh, the event on the track sounds and also the one for Groove Agent. Um, okay, so let's give it a shot here real quick. And I think we could do it with Groove Agent, the full version, if we want it to pretty easily. Um, so let's say, let's try it with SE. Okay, I'm just gonna. Okay, so let's say we drag we have this open we dragged the MIDI event here. So let's say we have that MIDI event. All right, so we have that. Um, and then it says, um, okay. But then I have a second thought. I might want to switch it with another groove agent. Um, so, so another groove agent MIDI part. Can I audition an alternative easily in some way? So if you want it to, if you're keeping the same kit, um, you know, you could say, okay, I want it to take this. And then what you could do if you wanted to switch is just go to your track versions and go to new version. And let me just drag, let's say this pattern out to the track. And now I could just come here and like, let's say while I'm playing, if I just wanted to switch between the two different ones, that would be all you'd have to do is just switch the actual uh, track versions for that event. So let's say for here, say, oh, do I like the first one or do I like the second one? So if you just wanted to switch between two different parts that are going on in the same kit, um, you just try track versions and then you could kind of switch around and then you never have to make an actual decision. It's great. Okay. All right, so we just see uh, from Alex Morgan, um, so is there a logical editor way to delete all notes except lowest would be amazing. If so, thank you so much. So I think we showed that just a little while ago. Um, so let me just add a chord track.
Okay, so let's say I okay, so I'm going to drag these down. Okay, so we look at our MIDI parts here. So we can see this going on. So uh, just make sure I'm reading it correctly. So logical editor preset to delete all notes except lowest would be amazing. So let's come over again to our logical editor. Um, so we say delete type is equal to note. Um, we'll say context variable is unequal to note number in chord, and the lowest note in the chord is zero. So if I did this right, it'll just delete everything except the lowest note in the chord. So once again, you could just, under function, delete, type is equal to note, context variable, is unequal to note number in chord and set that to zero. All right, John Costigan saying it's time to play like button with your host, Craig Undo. So. All right, so we have Rolf checking in from Germany. Thanks for joining us. All right, uh, so we have a question. Um, how can I record direct from the master channel to an audio track in Artist? Um, so, you know, once we have uh, like the audio going out, so let's say if I just, you know, have audio. Okay, so, you know, once we have the audio out, you know, let's say in our mix, you know, let's say if we're here and we have all of the audio going out directly in, you know, instead of recording it, um, you know, just do an export audio mix down. So let's say I want to set everything from here, so you know, if you don't need to actually record it and you just want the audio file in the project, you know, come directly over here and just do, uh, you know, an export audio mix down, you know, and you could just say, okay, I want to do my export audio mix down, and then you can say after export, create uh, audio track, and we'll say stereo mix, and we'll say, you know, export audio. And then you could just have your mix down file. So, you know, because it's at the end stage of the processing, you know, there's nowhere necessarily, you know, once it's at the master fader, you know, if it was all going to a, a group, we could do that. So, you know, if we had all the channels and we set it to like a group and then that group to the output, we could record that. But it, it's actually faster just to do an export audio mix down. And, and import the file directly back into the project again. So if there's a specific reason you need to do it in real time, let me know. Um, but otherwise, I think it's still faster because the export audio mix down would be faster than real time playback. All right, so we just see question when is the Cubase 12 release? So, you know, I can't really discuss the release date, but, you know, there's a lot of people working on it. So, 
you know, and as soon as it's out, we will do a live stream showing all the new wonderful stuff. Um, all right, so we see another question slash uh, future request. Is it possible to see more presets for logical editor? I know it's a powerful tool, but too hard to understand, or do we need a master class? So, you know, um, someone on the last live Zoom meetup, I think it was a composer, I think it was an English guy who's uh, based in Israel. Uh, I'm forgetting his name off the top of my head. Uh, but, you know, you could just go to the, you know, and he's like, oh, you know, it was like the logical, you know, it's like the live streams are perfect just for watching logical editor stuff, you know. So once you, you know, just try your try to do some, you know, the, I have donated a lot of presets to Steinberg for logical editor stuff. So a lot of things that we get asked here a lot. So, um, but, you know, you could always search the, the Cubase index and, you know, and there is, I did a whole tutorial on, you know, like how to get started with logical editor that's on the Steinberg uh, web channel, uh, on the Steinberg YouTube channel. All right, so we have a question. Um, so, hi, Greg. Having a classical trained piano player playing massively ahead in the studio, any kind of quantization gets confused. Is there a way to quantize to the right only? Uh, shift before quantize. Um, so, you know, if someone is playing kind of ahead of the beat constantly, um, you know, so if they're kind of a classically trained piano player, you know, I've found sometimes work, you know, changing the metronome sound can can help them to something kind of more traditional what they're used to hearing. Um, but I'm just trying to figure out, is, is there a way to quantize to the right only um, shift before quantize? So, you know, if you want to send me a, a file, I'd be happy to, you know, if you want to email me a file at um club cubase at steinberg.de uh you know just a project of just a midi track i'd be happy to show how to quantize it on tuesday's live stream if you wanted to do that um but i'm not sure when it's quantized to the right only um you know it could be that if they're playing all all the way ahead of the beat you know and it's off you know, so one time, sometimes you may have it where, you know, if it needs to be on a beat for other parts, but let me just open up a quick piano part that we could look at. You know, if they are consistently off the beat, you know, and we could look at a piano part here and just say, okay, I want it to, you know, move all of these. If they're like consistently off, like maybe latency is, um, you know, affecting their performance uh, and they're trying to self compensate because of latency issues. You know, it sounds like there's something wrong in the setup for the musician. Um, either the latency is throwing them off and they're trying to self compensate, or the click track is throwing them off. And that might be a better solution to try to solve that. Um, but, you know, if everything is you know, just off and you wanted to just, you know, shift it all, you could do that and just choose to enlarge the part as well. But if you wanted to email me the file, I could take a look at it and be happy to show it on Tuesday's live stream. All right, so we have a question from Best Korean Jesus. Thanks for, good to see you on the live stream again. Uh, it says, using sampler to move to Groove Agent, I cannot get the slices to be exclusive when set up right. Uh, voice is exclusive, but it works if I slice in Groove Agent. I uh, wanted to see if this was only me. Okay, so let me just 
come over here. Okay, so let's say I have a sampler track and I'm just gonna drag my drum loop into the sampler track and let's create slices. And now we have, and we're gonna migrate the sampler track here to Halion, or, or sorry, to Groove Agent SE. All right, so now we do this. Okay, um, if I, um, all right, so you can't get slices to be exclusive. Let's see if I can remember how to do this. I'll probably have a brain cramp on it, but let's take a look. Just try to remember where the exclusive setting was. Sorry for my brain cramp. All right, and I'll just try dragging it onto the loop onto a pad and see if we could slice it from here, if I could find it. Yeah, if you could just send me a quick reminder where the exclusive is set. I'm just having. Maybe I had to slice the. But yeah, if you want to do that, I'd be happy to kind of look into it. Sorry about that. See Jeff Sabelsky saying rest in peace to Meatloaf. So yeah, it was kind of sad to to learn the news of that. Okay, um, all right, so I see, can we make a MIDI send hit another track before the expression map? Uh, right now, a virtual MIDI driver seems to be the only solution to get out of Cubase and back in before the expression map uh, evaluation. So I don't know of a way to do that. So, um, so if you're not familiar with this, if you have like a MIDI track, you could have uh, MIDI sends. So let's say if we have a MIDI track here. And then we could send this information out to other 
MIDI destinations, but it may also include the, um, so, but you might be able to, let's look and see if maybe on the input transformer, if we could filter out maybe note expression I, th I was I didn't think we would be able to but I was just seeing if there's a way of filtering out note expressions or we could filter out particular notes uh, on the track um, that would be within the expression range but not a way that you would have to not do it manually that I know of but I'll pass that along Okay, um, all right, so let's see a question. Um, I'm, I'm trying to get Cubase. I have a Zeddy 10FX. Can I get some advice uh, as far as my software and sound interface with Zeddy Steinberg? Um, so I'm not familiar with the Zeddy interface, the Z-I-D-I. Um, let me just Google it real quick here on on my system, bear with me just a second. So uh, I guess it's the Allen and Heath console. Um, okay, um, so it says, um, so, you know, any, you know, depending on the number of inputs and outputs, you know, Cubase will be able to accept all of the inputs and outputs. I'm not sure if the, if that is set up to include the effects or not within its drivers. Um, but you know, some digital consoles will allow you to do that. Some will just do straight tracking without effects. Um, but I'm not familiar with the Allen and Heath consoles, unfortunately. So. Okay. So we have a question. Um, says, uh, can you remind us how to do a reference in control room and is it possible to do a preset for this uh, or we need to do it manually all the time? So once you have like, a, you could have like, you know, a track just set up as a, as a t uh, reference. But what I do is I'll just kind of set it up. Go to this file here. This is created by my friend Clay Ostwald, who's incredibly talented. Just got an email from him today. Okay, so let's say I have my mix going. Um, and what I do is I set up just a you know, the mechanics of it, you could set up and kind of leave. I set up just a, in my audio connections, uh, I will have a Q mix. So I'll just do this from scratch and I'll just have my Q mix. I'm going to add a Q and we'll make it stereo and I'll call this reference. And get my keyboard on the right. Okay, so we're gonna have 
our reference mix, so that's our second cue. So what I want to do is here, I'm going to, let's say do like a really horrible EQ and take this beautiful song and destroy it. So let's say that's my mix, uh, but we have a mix here that and we're gonna use this as a reference. Um, so when I go to this particular track, what I want to do is for the output, I'm gonna send it to no bus and click on the Q sends. And our second Q send is where we have our, um, where we have this up for our reference, our reference mix. So now I could listen to my mix. And then if I want to go to the reference, I could just switch back and forth between reference and my mix. And the reason why we could set up a reference mix not to go through the master channel and to go through the control room is now when we do this, it's not going, you know, many times when we're mixing, we don't have a, uh, we don't have the capability of, you know, there'll be effects processing going on. So you may, might have limiter, EQ, you know, compressor, you know, typical master effects processing. And then if we send our reference track through this master processing chain of something that's already been mastered, it, it's not an accurate portrayal of the reference. So this way, when we send it, not to go out to the stereo bus, but we send it to the control room, at that point, we bypass the uh, all of the master effects processing. So once you have that control set up, all you have to do is just you know take your import a reference track, send it to no bus, and send it to your uh, QMix, and then you could just toggle back and forth. All right, so we have Antonio checking in from Quebec. Thanks for joining us. All right, um, so I just see, just on a question, going back to the Zeti uh, interface, uh, it says, I don't have an active license for Steinberg, but I have all the hardware and USB interface with Steinberg. Also, I have two computers. So if you could let us know like which license of Steinberg products that you have, I'm not sure if that audio, if that mixer comes with like a Cubase LE or something like that. But if you have an audio interface, you would need to activate your Steinberg license first. All right, so we just uh, see from Sven Isaacson just saying, uh, you just checked in Dorco 4 SE that contact opens fine. I believe the latest is M1 native. So I don't think it's M1 native, uh, but I, think it's you know I, I could be mistaken but uh, I know they just went to VST3 a couple months ago and the VST2 versions uh, won't do that but it may be VST3 compatible but um, but you know you may have to run the third you know running the third party plugins might just automatically open in Rosetta if you've had that set up Okay, so we just see from uh, Ryan Johnson says uh, I've downloaded under Steinberg and eLicenser is eLicenser anymore? Just won't run the application now. So yeah, you need to use the eLicenser for the current versions of Cubase. Uh, but you know, so you would you know if you have a download access code, what you need to do, Ryan, is you know go to the Steinberg Download Assistant. And then you'll see, you know, often when you get a version of Cubase electronically or you get like an OEM, 
you would just come over here, you would have a download access code. Um, and if you don't have a license or a download access code, you would just need to purchase it from a dealer or from the website. Uh, and so you could come right over here, uh, enter your download access code, and that would take you to the appropriate uh, uh, library or installer to download and would automatically authorize your e-licensor for you. So. All right, wonderful to see Ben Shirley on the live stream. All right, uh, so just seeing more uh, discussion of Ryan's Cubase. It looks like it's in Cubase LE. Um, so I just see Ryan just says, it is Cubase 11 LE or 10 maybe, but it's an older version, but I wanted to see if I get a newer version. She said since January, everything would roll over, but it didn't. So it's the Cubase license isn't rolling over in January. So it's with the release of 12 is when it'll be on a new license management system. Uh, but you have to, you know, it, it, you know, you have to either enter the download access code, uh, you know, depending on which version you have. So, you know, see what code you have if you haven't activated it. Uh, but you would need to do that for to get your Cubase running. Okay, uh, so it says when I'm using Groove Agent 5 and I'm making a pattern under the instrument tab, I then try to note repeat my hi hats. Uh, note repeats the whole pattern. Is there a way to fix this? I'm using Cubase Pro 11. So let's go ahead and take a look. So we'll do this in the full Groove Agent offers kind of note repeat functionality. All right, so let's say, okay, so I want it to come here. Okay, I'm just getting my controller mapped. All right, so let's say if I want it to uh, come over to perform, uh, we could activate this. And I'm gonna... All right, so now I'm gonna hold down just a hi-hat. And when I hit the particular note here, so that I could do different note repeats. So if I hit C sharp five, while holding down the hi-hat, we'll get quarter note triplets, eighth notes, eighth note, sixteenth notes. So this is how we could activate kind of different note repeat options. So let's say if I wanted to do this kind of while it was playing internally. So let's say we have, let's say a pattern going on and I'll just load the kit with the pattern. Sorry about that. All right, so now. Slow down. So let's say now. And I'm gonna activate the note repeat. So I need to hit kind of the hi-hat note. So I could trigger the note repeats here. Um, 
All right, so that's how you can do it. So you know, you may need to hit the uh, note that you want it to do, uh, and then hit the note repeat at the same time. Um, okay, so so and it's say it was making a pattern here. So I'm not sure. So say if we go to the pattern, and let's go to edit. Uh, So let's see if we could do this internally. Okay. So So that allowed me so as soon as I hit record here, it didn't record every single note, so I hit kind of the note and the note repeat MIDI message. So when we go to our performance, uh, you know, you could set these particular MIDI notes, uh, but even within the internal sequencer, I could record that just when we come over here to instrument. Um, so, you know, make sure that you hit the note that you want to do the repeat on as well as the note to trigger the rhythmic value for the repeat. But once we come over here into edit, we can see that the hi-hat was automatically added in there. So let me know if that's what you wanted to learn. All right, so also see Ryan with the Allen and Heath interface says I uh, also have a Nova system with sound card and also interface. Um, but, you know, check to see, you know, exactly, uh, you know, which hardware you got your Cubase LE version from. But. Because I'm not sure if the Allen and Heath comes with Cubase LE or, you know. Okay, uh, so to see question, uh, Greg, I upgraded uh, to Groove Agent 5 full version, uh, and the MIDI loops don't seem well matched to the kits. I hear lots of cymbals, toms, but not a lot of kick, snare, hi hat, any suggestions, key maps. So one of the things that could that could throw people off. So when we come here, obviously, you know, when we, you could load up a kit with patterns. So each, you know, most of the kits themselves will come with patterns that are set up specifically for that. So it's, you know, and each kit may have, one kit may have six kick drums, one may have one kick drum. So it could really depend on what's, what's going on with the pattern. So, you know, if we come over here, let's say I have this kit and I come over here to the pattern editor, it, you know, this may not align because there's gonna be different samples in each of the kits. So I'll say, let's come over here to styles and I wanted this to be uh, like an acid jazz, so. So, you know, depending on what you're going through, you know, this may, you know, these may be tied directly to other sources. So if I wanted to. So, but, you know, always kind of start initially, you could right click on the agent and just say load kit with patterns and that will load up the patterns that are you know specifically programmed for that kit so now when we come over here um you could try you know so going through some of these aren't you know maybe patterns that you could remap but you know always start with the pattern that's kind of associated with the kits so if i wanted to go to you know, garage rock, but playing kind of a hip hop kit, you may get like really pleasantly surprised. Let's try maybe a grunge pattern. So you could just kind of come. Let's come over here. 
over here too, Garage Rock. So realize that, you know, each of the patterns are really could be associated with a particular instrument and may not translate to every instrument because every, you know, there's so many different kits that will have different instrumentation. So. Okay, uh, we see from Dan Freeman, uh, what do the first abbreviations like AM mean in presets, like channel presets? Is there a resource explaining them somewhere? Uh, I think there are presets developed by Alan Morgan. So it's AM his, are his initials. So he's a producer, engineer, uh, who's done uh, wonderful records, really great guy. And he's done a lot of content for us over the years, like presets and stuff like that. So I think that's what it means. It's uh, a preset that was uh, developed by Alan Morgan. see um just see a comment cubase looks very similar to studio one anyone noticed it might be the other way around yeah so okay so we see uh do you guys have nuendo videos as well one of my friends used to use that and cubase so there are you know we answer nuendo and cubase and wavelab and halion and you know other you know any steinberg question here but there are nuendo live streams i think that there was one yesterday so, Okay, so I just see how I miss events, 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 especially static to, uh, I have the events minus 10, 10 dB normalize and then start to mix and the event volume from there are hardly touch to faders, uh, only for clipping purposes. I mean, you could do that very easily, you know, and Steinberg is really the first company that offered uh, this particular functionality where you could, you know, come over here and just take you know, all of your events and do kind of event clip gain uh, control. So you could just adjust the volume uh, very easily here. So. Okay, so we see, um, can I get a view of the spectrum analyzer? So we could do this, there's a number of different views within uh, frequency or the uh, supervision plugin rather. So let's say, let's say if I want to take this and I'll just turn this down so it's not as annoyingly loud. So let's say, so here we could have 18 different meters. So if I wanted to look at my spectrum curve and let's look at our spectrum bar. Look at spectrum intensity. So, spectrogram. Or even uh, chromogram. So, if you wanted to come here.
So I'd say we'll just. So different. So all sorts of different meters that you could have. And then if you wanted these to be on, okay, I wanted to only look at the stereo bus or we could look at, you know, just the mid channel in this one. Or just the left channel or the sides. So there's all sorts of pretty amazing metering options with supervision. Okay, uh, so we have a question. Is it possible to have an audio track guitar with virtual amp record on the same track and hear what you're recording and what was before on the audio track uh, in the same time? So, you know, if we, you know, so we're gonna have like one guitar part, you know, so let's say if, you know, if, it, if you wanted to hear like the existing, like a pre-existing guitar part, um, so like here we could say, okay, I want it to, um, come over here. So let's say we have our guitar and this is running through the VST amp rack. So if we wanted to bypass this, we'll hear. Um, so if you wanted to you know, hear what was before on the audio track at the same time, you know, it's just use, all you had to do really is just, you know, you could just duplicate the track uh, and you could duplicate the track without events. Um, but, you know, if you want it to, if I'm, I think I'm understanding, but if I'm not, you know, please let me know. But if you wanted to hear your guitar over on the same track over existing is like you just need to have a different track. So which is, you know, there's no limit to track. So there's no reason not to. So. OK, so we see Soren just saying thanks, Greg, for the answer about Groove Agent track version. So hopefully that helps. Uh, so we have a question, is it possible to master on Cubase? So many people do, uh, but you know, we do have really you know, dedicated mastering solution in WaveLab. It could really depend on, you know, there's many different uh, definitions of mastering. So a mastering engineer generally went master in a DAW and would use a dedicated tool like WaveLab. If, you know, if mastering is going to be you know, processing like you know, a stereo audio file with additional you know, plugins and doing stuff like that, you know, Cubase would do that very easily. All right, uh, anyone, is it true that I can use VST MPC beats into Cubase like I can for reason? So if it's a VST plugin, it will definitely work. Um, so I'm not sure if it's a, a particular piece of software or software that's driving uh, an MPC hardware device. Um, but if it's a VST, you know, I would say if it's VST that it would work inside of Cubase because, you know, we invented VST. All right, uh, how can I install Auto-Tune into Cubase 5.12? It says Auto-Tune 8.1 is missing. So, you know, generally any plugin, uh, you know, any VST plugin, it will work. Make sure that it's a 64-bit version and use the VST3 version. will probably give you best results, but, you know, uh, I don't have an Auto-Tune license on this, on my computer, but, um, you know, but you could also check out, like, you know, the solutions that we have for, 
very audio editing if you wanted to do this you know where you could edit graphically or even to the point where you could use inserts like pitch correct um, but you should be able to there's you know obviously lots of people that are using autotune in cubase but with some of the included tools you may not need to so um, but it would probably be you, know, you may want to contact Antares and see why it doesn't um, you know, but make sure a it's it's sixty four bit that you have VST three. So we see that nice Cubase has drag and drop just like Studio One. So again, Cubase was doing drag and drop years before Studio One was ever conceived. All right, we just see a question. How do I back up the key commands? Um, so if you come over here, go to edit, you can go to profile manager and export your profile manager. You could also find it within your preferences folder. Uh, but if you export a profile that would include all your key commands, macros, user created workspace, global workspaces, uh, user created track presets, kind of everything you'd need to migrate from you know, a, a completely different version of Cubase than what you have. So. Uh, so you just see from Stepsum um, or StepSM, did hi Greg, did you receive my question by email? So I, I will get to like emailed questions uh, as we get towards the end. So I'm not sure which one it was, but I, it sounds familiar. Hang on just one second, the sun's knocking. All right, sorry for the delay. All right, we'll jump back in.
All right, so I just see a comment. If Cubase requires iLock to work, then maybe that's why I didn't go for Cubase in the first place. So Cubase doesn't use iLock. All right. All right, so we see uh, how does Cubase handle timing to the grid drums, for example? So if it's like uh, like a multi-track pro, you know, a multi-track audio quantize, like for a, for acoustic drums, um, so we could do that quite easily. So let's come over here. I'll revert this. So let's say I wanted to listen to the drums and quantize the drums easily. I can say, okay, I wanted to take these drums here and I have them in a folder. And if we turn on our click track, we can see that these aren't, like when drum fills come in, it's kind of dragging. I think there's a snare fill coming up that will rush. So if I wanted to clean these up, what I could do first is I'm gonna find hit points for some of the significant audio events here. So I'm gonna to go to uh, hit points in the sample editor. So we'll double click here and get to hit points. And we'll say, okay, I wanted to find kind of the relevant drum parts. And now at this point I could say, let's adjust kind of our threshold so that we're not having tracks that are bleeding through. I will come to my snare top and I will edit the hit points here. And let's do the same for our hi-hat in this case. And the goal is to have just kind of not the tracks that are bleeding through. At this point, we have this function called group editing. So I'm going to, at this point, enable group editing. And now any edit that I do uh, on one file will automatically be kind of rendered to all of the files. So at this point, I want to say I'm going to quantize. And we could set priority. So I could say my kick is going to have the highest priority. And then I want my snare and let's say hi-hat, and I'm gonna set the priority according there, and I want this to quantize to 16th notes. So once we've, we've created that, what we're going to do now is to just say, we'll take this. Okay, so we now will come over here and we'll say, let's create slices. And now it's kind of sliced all of the audio up for us. Uh, we say we're going to quantize it now to 16th notes. We can see all the different areas shift. And as we do this, sometimes we may have gaps that are introduced. And we could just choose to crossfade. So now if we wanted to listen to our drums with the click. We could see that the drums will all be kind of cleaned up. So you could do multi-track quantizing uh, very easily using the functionality in Cubase. So, but all sorts of different grid stuff that you could do. All right, so we're just seeing um, so it's just see a comment from Nautica just saying uh, Cubase doesn't so Cubase doesn't have a free version. Um, you know, we don't have a free version, so there are versions that are bundled with a lot of audio interfaces, uh, but there is no free versions. Um, and again, we have a question: Is uh, Cubase on iLock? No, it's not. So it uses eLicenser currently, but it's migrating to a new licensing system with the release of version twelve. 
All right, so we have Trond checking in from Norway. All right, uh, so we see how do I transfer a template from uh, Cubase 10.5 to 11 on a different computer? So I believe that the templates are gonna be stored within the profile manager. Um, so you could do it that way, but a template is when you, you know, when you first start off, all you have to do is, let's say you have a template set up. Uh, so you come over here, let's say, okay, this is my default template. And I have that set up before we actually do anything. All you have to do is, you know, just save a song. So a template is really a song, save the song, take the song into the new computer. And before you add anything at that point, click on save as template. All right, so we see Michael Teams has granted me one gallon of lemon meringue pie ice cream for my family and myself. Thank you very much. Okay, my timeline jump, jumped on me, so I'm trying to find my spot. Okay, so I just see Ryan Johnson um, just saying, I got it when I've got the Steinberg Z10FX. So this, this Stein, this, the Z10FX is not a Steinberg product. So you probably, for Ryan, wouldn't get the Steinberg uh, product with that. So I'm not sure if the Allen and Heath comes with Cubase LE or not, but it's not a Steinberg product. All right, so I see from Jeff Sabelski, just a question. Uh, with a softer dynamic on a soundtrack for YouTube video, would a soothing classical type volume still be maximized to compete with all the brash levels of everything else in your opinion? I would say that as long as your YouTube video is heard uh, and, and the volumes are like not a detriment where someone's like, oh, I'm, I'm gonna skip it because I can't hear it. I, I wouldn't worry about it as much, um, so. Uh, so I just see a comment from Dan Freeman, a question, is there a way to see older text from this live stream? I've tried top and live chats already. So at a, at a certain point, it kind of uh, runs out, but it will be in the, uh, the text will be replayed uh, if you choose during the live stream after it's posted to YouTube.
Okay, so we're seeing from uh, Best Korean Jesus just saying, uh, I have no idea whenever I bring up a long loop in the sampler and chop it up and import it to Groove Agent, it doesn't go exclusive on one shot. It plays the entire loop. So let me, I'll just jump back and we'll check that again. But it didn't seem, I think it translated okay for me. Uh, but let's take a look uh, just to make sure. So let's come over here. Okay, so let's say we'll take this from uh, this loop into the sampler track. Okay, and I'm gonna do the slices and send those slices. You know, and make sure you should see all the slices here, obviously, uh, but send it to Groove Agent SE. And what it could be is when you're in Groove Agent SE that um, you know, when we look at this now, you know, it's only transferring over those slices for me. Um, and you know, what, it, what you may want to do is like, once we come over to the rock loop is we could take this MIDI information here. So let's say I'm gonna drag this MIDI file over and now we could, let's say we have this in Groove Agent. So now when we do this, we could trigger those slices. So now these slices are just being mapped out to Groove Agent from there, but it seems like it's just transferring over the slices correctly for me. Uh, so we see a uh, question is editing have anything to do with the audio sound card or routing. So generally editing is going to be, you know, actually editing uh, audio itself, but the sound card captures the audio and the routing sends the audio out through a software mixer or out to the sound card. So they're usually different. Okay, so we have a question from Benny. Uh, what do you do when you set left and right locators with one click? Uh, so if I wanna set the left and right locators with one click, I just select the event and hit the letter P for like parts to locator. So just P. So it's a great keyboard shortcut to know. So just see from Best Cream Jesus, he wants to get MPC style chops and Groove Agent from Sampler, but it doesn't work, I'll send a video. So yeah, I could hopefully show you how to get the workflow going. All right, so we see, can I load my own samples in Media Bay? So yes, Media Bay can show you any samples that you want. 
So it may not show as like if you wanted to see with like, you know, pretty icons here, but all you have to do is go to the file browser and then you could look anywhere on your computer. And if you wanted to jump to specific uh, locations, you could right click and on a particular folder and then you could add them to favorites. So you could just come here, so say, While I'm here, I could just say, I want to take this folder and add favorite. And then if I wanted to uh, quickly navigate to all of my loops, I could just go to my favorites and just say, oh, let's go to those files right there. All right, so we have Ubukun from Nigeria. Thanks for joining us, and you don't have to worry about joining late. All right, uh, so we see, hi, Greg. Is there a key command or possibly a macro to tap tempo to change project tempo? You know, so what you could do is, you know, if you go to the project menu, you could just go to the beat calculator, and you could click on tap tempo and hit your space bar and then hit OK, uh, and you could just import that at the selection start or at the tempo track start, and then you could just do it just like that. So if you wanted to get a feel, like I know a lot of people may watch videos and they just want to kind of get like, a, like when they're composing, they may just kind of tap like a rhythmic feel. So you could just go to the beat calculator, to hit, click on the tap tempo, and at that point, just have it automatically put at the selection start or at the tracks, tempo track start. Okay, so I just see from Best Korean Jesus says, um, says he get it to working if he chops up the long loop into separate samples and never works from sampler to groove agent I'll email do I attach a YouTube link to video problem yeah if you want to send like a private YouTube link that'd be great and also make sure you know it, it could also depend on you know when you're doing sample slices you know if you're doing it in the sampler you know there's 128 MIDI notes so if there's a lot more slices than that that's required that could also be an issue Okay, so we see um, Robbie Bowling asking a rhetorical question. Will there be a time when Cubase won't support VST2 plugins? Uh, I use universal audio products. Um, so, you know, Steinberg announced, I think, yesterday or the day before that, you know, that within two years, they expect to not be utilizing VST2 plugins. Um, I thought I saw on a Facebook post that you know universal audio is you know already upgrading to vst3 i could be mistaken uh i know sound toys is is because the vst2 plugins aren't going to be working on apple m1 processors so uh you know there's a two-year period for that and you know vst3 has been out since 2008 so it's um, so I think we'll see because of the changes in processors that a lot of companies will migrate uh, comfortably within that time. So, all right, we have Tiago checking in from Brazil. Thanks for joining. Okay, so we have uh, Andy from Alexandria. So if you're in Alexandria, Virginia, I am too. Um, 
So uh, have you heard anything about upgrading to Windows 11 from 10? Every time I upgrade, it wipes out my e-licensor info, and then I have to call customer service. Uh, Elements 10.5. So, you know, it could be that you would just need to, um, you know, reinstall e-licensor. Uh, if you have your license, you know, if you have a USB e-licensor, you could store that on your, um, you know, directly on the USB e-licensor, and then you don't have to worry about that. Uh, but, you know, but usually just reinstalling the e-licensor software helps. So. See, Michael Teams is saying we're missing Michael Pierce. Yeah, I'm looking for his uh, soup flavor of the day, so. Okay, uh, so you see, hi Greg, is there a way to select just the lowest note in the dyad uh, while leaving that same note unselected when it's playing by itself with logical editor? I'm trying to flam kick and snare hits. So we, yeah, we've done that. Um, we've done that twice already in the live stream, but we'll, if we'll show it just one more time. Okay, so I will drag these down and we'll just create Okay, so I just saw the email from Best Cream Jesus. So thanks for sending that. All right, so Okay, so just selecting the lowest notes. So we just said, uh, like, so we'll just say to select the lowest note and leave the same note while leaving that same note unselected while it's playing by itself. Um, so if you wanted to delete everything except the lowest notes, you could do just that. Um, if you wanted to select just the lowest notes, um, so at this point I could just say, let's, we'll just select the lowest notes. So you could do stuff like that, but you know, so, but if you wanted to just have the low notes, you know, you could just do just like what we did. All right. Uh, hey, Greg, can you describe the best purpose for the spectrum meter? Um, so a lot of people end up using like the spectrum meter to find kind of problematic frequencies. So let's say if we're doing it on a particular uh, project here. And let's say while we're doing this and I just want it I'll take off my obnoxious EQ. 
So while we're doing this, if I wanted to find, you know, particular frequencies that I might want to be aware of, you know, here we could just actually just look and find particular frequencies. So let's say if I come over here, let's go to the analyzer, to supervision. So I could just say, okay, we'll look at our spectrum bar. And then if I see like a lot of activity around here, I can say, oh, I need to EQ around 120 Hertz. You know, if I see a lot of activity kind of going here, okay, this is, we have a lot of 57 Hertz. Maybe I want to EQ that out. Maybe I wanted to add some more high ends with EQs and what frequency ranges. So it's just to give you that perspective of what's going on sonically within your mix so that you could apply EQ or, you know, and to make corrections and do stuff like that. All right, uh, so we have a question. Is it possible to send multiple tracks to a single effects track but pan each individually or pan each differently? So as soon as we come over here, I'll just show it in the smaller project. It's a little easier to understand. So if we have like our guitars both going to, let's say a send effect. So I'm gonna send both of these um, or actually I have this already set up in a particular project. Save some time. All right, so when I come over here, let's say I go to my um, mix console and we have like two guitar parts here. So let's say I'm gonna have um, All right, so I'll just come here. So let's say our guitar parts. So when I come here, if I wanted to have like the sends, let's say I'll take both of these guitar parts and they're panned. Um, I'll take both these guitar parts and we will add an effect send. So I wanted to do a reverb. Okay, and I'll just switch this over to like a plate. We'll do kind of a big plate. Okay, so now when we listen to our guitars, I'll come over here and we'll go to our sends. We'll have our reverb. So, and now I'll switch to my, so we'll add, so now we have reverb on both guitars, but what I want to do is to, let's solo this guitar. The other guitar will just come over here. So, and then we'll see panning. So at this point I could pan independently. So I could have the guitar on the left side, but the reverb on the right side. So let's come here to this guitar. So I want this guitar kind of pan to the right, but it's reverb pan to the left. So it's the same reverb, but we can pan individually. So just go to the bottom and then we'll see panning here. And then we'll be able to have the guitar on the right, but it's reverb on the left and the guitar that's on the left with its reverb on the right. So we listen to that in context. So just come over here and where you see the sends, 
uh, and you'll see the destination. Just click on panning, and then you could pan independently each of the mm -hmm. reverb sends. All right, uh, so we see, hi Greg, I uh, would love a quick tutorial on MIDI gate. Okay, so let's come over here and I'm going to create a, let's come over here to the inserts. So let's say if I wanna take, um, let's see if I have all my drums going to, okay, so I have a drum bus here. Okay, so let's say I will come over here, let's go to our dynamics and then we'll have MIDI gate. All right, so now what we want to do is just to add, let me just, excuse me, I have to sneeze. All right, sorry about that. Um, so we're gonna have this on our drum bus as an in. Let's do just our uh, MIDI gate here on our dynamics. Okay. So now what I want to do is to have a MIDI track, and we're gonna take this to our inserts and. We'll say drums or insert MIDI gate. So now when I start playing, um, we could, let's come over here, let's activate our drum bus. And now that we have, just do this on a simpler project, sorry. But what we could do is kind of open a gate by sending MIDI messages to it, but we need to just create kind of a, uh, okay, so I'll take this folder and we'll route all these to group. Okay, so now when you sell the group, we'll just have drums Let me just send this all to Okay, so now we have our drum, so let's put a MIDI gate on. And then I'm gonna add a MIDI track and we're gonna have this be the input for so we'll get to the inspector its output is going to so now when I send a MIDI message it opens the gate So I, I hit my MIDI keyboard, we could open the gate. So that way we could just have a MIDI message that opens the gate on and off, so.
All right, so we have a question. Is there any way to make a copy of my e-licensor to an external drive and then reinstall it just in case? I do love my e-licensor info, Elements 10.5, Windows 10. So once it's a soft e-license, you could transfer it to a hardware e-licensor. Um, and then, but you can't necessarily take it off the hardware e-licensor back to a soft e-license. So, but if you wanted to do that, uh, you could migrate it permanently to a, a hardware USB e-licensor. All right, wonderful to see Gareth has made the live stream. Just sending comments about meatloaf's passing. Okay, so we see uh, rendering MIDI to audio has a tail. When trying to extend a rendered audio loops, misaligned from the grid, splicing the audio end to end sounds choppy when extending loop from eight bars to 16 bars. Okay, so let's um, I'll just take a look at something here quickly. So generally, if it's going to have uh, a tail, it's because it was told to do that. So Okay, so if you have a point where, let's say, okay, I wanted to take a, I'll take this, uh, we'll take a drum pattern here that will render. Okay, so I'm going to select this and now when we go to render, uh, so say let's render in place and I'll just say, you know, we're not going to have a tail. So you, you could just specifically choose for it not to have a tail. So we'll say we're gonna render that and we'll notice that it's, and I probably had it armed for record. So that. Okay, so I'll just come here. We'll do render in place. So we see that now it's the exact length. So we could have that automatically fit on the grid but just make sure that your render in place, you know, when you go to the render settings, that you could choose to have the tail on or off, um, but you just need to set the tail size and you do that in seconds or milliseconds. So if it's at the tail is not allowing it to copy like an even eight to 16 bars uh, because of the tail mode, just simply, you know, turn the tail off that was just turned on. So to see a comment about Jan. Uh, so I think we had 15,000 questions a couple weeks ago, maybe early last week. So yeah, we, we have a lot of questions, so. All right, uh, so to see, hi Greg. Uh, I, have a problem using Roland sustain pedal. It's reversed. Uh, um, it's reversed with Cubase. Please advise. So you know, usually sustain. You know, it could really depend on the controller. Um, so sometimes what you have to do. I just did this for my MIDI controller. You know, uh, many of the foot switches will have a little switch on it, and you could do that. Uh, but the but most of the MIDI controllers are active sensing. So if you turn the controller off with the pedal turned on, 
or with the pedal connected, it should actively sense if it's, you know, something a controller made in the last couple of years. Um, but, you know, so try that. But, you know, Cubase, it's just whatever, you, that's what your MIDI controller is transmitting. So if you could share what MIDI controller you're using the Roland pedal with, you know, because Cubase is just looking at what the controller is actually um, transmitting. So I see kind words from Jazz Dude. It says, uh, before COVID, there's only one hangout per month. Now eight hangouts. Uh, Greg now share, shares eight hours per week with us. Uh, big shout out to Greg. So thank you for the kind words. Um, so it's nice not to have to be on planes. I used to do like 120 flights a year. So it's, I, it's much more efficient to do live streams and talk to more people. But thank you. And I appreciate all you do for the community, Jazz Dude. So kudos to you. All right, uh, so it says, hello, I can't reactivate my Cubase 11 elements. Contacting the support brings me always back to the main menu. Um, so when you're, if you're trying to reactivate your Cubase 11 elements, so, you know, it's for, if it's on, I'm not sure if it's on a soft e-license or not, but if it's on a soft e-license, you would, and you have a new computer, what you would need to do, and you could just say, is request a reactivation code. So if you just say, you know, I just reactivate Cubase soft e-licensor, you, re you can request a new activation code. So you could just do this entirely online uh, but you could always move it to a uh, like a hardware USB e licensor, and then you can move that to any computer that you want to use. All right, so uh, I know. Uh, so I see Jazz Dudes just. So Jazz Dude just saying, it's still a great work ethic, Greg. You could just stay home and chill. Uh, I vote for a promotion. So I'll, I'll take a promotion. Maybe my 30th anniversary in April, they'll do something. Who knows? Probably not. All right. So uh, I know we had some questions that were mailed in. Let's get to those. See how we're doing on time. Okay. Kind of right where I thought we would be. So thanks for all the great questions. And if you've learned something new, make sure you do hit the like button. And if you haven't subscribed to the channel, that you do that as well. Okay, uh, so we had a, a question uh, on free warping. Uh, near the end of December 10th, 2021 live stream, uh, you showed us that moving a free warp marker by grabbing the top hover and grab rather than grabbing the lower down on the marker and moving the marker in one direction will nudge the marked audio vent in the opposite direction by an amount equal to the marker's movement, thereby adding what you what you term space uh, to the, to one side of the interface, uh, one side of the audio vent. What difference or advantage, if any, results from doing this contrary movement approach instead of just moving the audio vent itself by grabbing the marker anywhere below the top? Uh, the time grid appears to remain the same after moving the audio event. No other events seem to be affected. Okay. So, and he was kind enough to send a video link from the previous live stream. But let's say if I'm doing free warping here. So, I'll first go to hit points. And we want to create the warp markers from the hit points. And we'll go to the audio warp. So, and I kind of had this question from two people had mailed it in. All right, so when we want to do free warp editing, so I'll activate free warp. All right. All right, I'll just, just reset this real quick. 
Okay, so we'll come over here to, we'll define our hit points. Okay, and now create warp markers, get an audio warp. All right, so now we have these. So, you know, so questions I had were, you know, why would you do this uh, moving, uh, this like warping versus kind of moving events? And maybe I could even show it a little better on one of the tracks I did for Gareth, Michael Teams, and Pob, Pablo. So let me see. I still have it in here. Just okay, so this is Michael Teams and Gareth and Pablo who done this, uh, and I'm lucky to, to allow them to let me play bass. So it's a sleeping refuge. All right, so let's say I want to take this. Um, so a lot of times, you know, so the question was, you know, why don't you just kind of cut the an audio event and move it? Why do why not do that as opposed to kind of warping? Um, so once we do warping, I'll come over here. We'll just set up uh, our sample editor, and we go to the hit points. And we'll set kind of our intensity here uh, and we'll create our warp markers. So now when I go to audio warp and we activate this, um, what this does is, you know, if I wanted to listen to this particular. So let's say I wanted this note to be on beat four. So instead of kind of chopping this note off artificially, I could just kind of drag this and that will time compress the notes so that what's coming before and after gets stretched to fit. So now I could just come here. So as opposed to kind of leaving a space or having an unnatural transition, I could just choose to uh, come over here and warp the events and this event will just kind of gradually time compress to like the event before will time compress to you know to be shorter in length and this will automatically t expand and stretch the audio to be longer so that's why we would use kind of uh, warping as opposed to moving the particular events All right, uh, so I just see, uh, I want to save a sysx dump from an old synth into Cubase 11. So uh, I can save as sysx file, as per the manual, I record the dump and then open the list editor and navigate to comments. I highlight the first comment, uh, then I'm prompted to save as sysx, but I look at the file size and it looks to be saving only the first line of the code. How do I save all the data dump as one sysx file? So um, I meant to download this. Let me just find a, a sysx file here real quick. Okay, so, and I'm gonna come to uh, a MIDI part here.
and we'll go to the list editor, and this is where we need to go into for sysx. So I will go ahead. Um, let's choose. We're going to import a sysx. I'm going to create just a quick event. Go to the comments, and we'll import. And let's go to downloads. It will show up under recents. If we're lucky, probably not. Okay, so here's our analog one, sysx. All right, so when I, so I have this as my sysx dump here. Um, all right, so now when I come over here, um, let's say I will go to the comments and I'm gonna export A, 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 sysx, and we'll put it into downloads folder. Okay, so I will go ahead and let's add a new audio track, or new MIDI track, rather. All right, and we'll look at it in the list editor. And we get to import, which you see under downloads, we'll look for aaa.sysx file. So that looks the same to me. So, um, you know, if you, so that looks like it imported and exported fine. I know a lot of people will just kind of save parts or, you know, save it as a standard MIDI file as well. If you need to, to store like, you know, patch banks, but if you could let me know, but it seems like it, um, you know, kept all of the same sysx data importing and exporting. But if you wanted to email me the, your sysx file, I'd be happy to take a look at it. And you can send that to uh, uh, to uh, Club Cubase at Steinberg.de. All right, so we have a question. Is there a way to manage the actual numbers on tracks? Uh, when I delete tracks or disable them, I would want to be able to renumber them starting from zero, 01 instead of it using the first active track or non deleted track number, hope this makes sense. All right, so let's say if I come here, I'm gonna go to, let's add 25 audio tracks. Okay, so when we go to the mix console, we could see uh, that I think it was what he's referring to is the track number here. Um, so generally when we deal with stuff, it's gonna be like based on the name of the track. So if I come here and, and let's say delete um, eight through 12, if I hold around the right modifier key, that would help. All right, so I'm gonna try shift now. So if I delete these tracks, so I'm gonna remove these tracks from the project. All right, so it still will go 11, 12, 13, just based on the tracks, but you know the names of the tracks are the same, but I don't know of a way to kind of be able to manipulate these numbers, if that's what you're looking for. Um, so it says when you delete tracks or disable them, I would want to be able to renumber them starting from zero, one, instead of the first active track or non-deleted track number. Um, so let me know if, the, if this is the number that you're intending to see or if you wanted to see based on the track name. And just I thought that there was one more question from 
Jan, let me see if it's if I copied it over. If not, I'll put it into Tuesday's live stream. All right, so we got that about warp markers. All right, um, all right. So let me, I'm going to go back to our live chat. So bear with me a second while I switch back. All right, so we see Pablo has made the live stream. All right. Just trying to find my spot. Okay, so to see, um, So when I used a MIDI controller to control the functions of Cubase through Mackie control, then for some reason along with the execution of the functions, information about the notes is also sent. So if you're doing Mackie control functions and it's kind of playing a MIDI note, what you want to do is to go to your studio setup um, and go to the MIDI port setup and where the port that you have set up for your Mackie control in the MIDI port setup, we want to uncheck in all MIDI inputs. So just do that, and then it's not going to play uh, like piano sounds for you every time you hit play or stop. Okay, read through comments. Just see comment, is it true that Greg is going to be cloned and shipped with Cubase 12? So maybe when I retire, so, but Got a number of years. Had to get my son through college. So, All right, so we see Graham Witcher on the live stream. And he's put forth broccoli cheese soup. That sounds good. We have a nice cold day here, so broccoli cheese soup would be good. And thanks for joining us. All right. All right, so we see a question. Um, in Cubase 11, how do you save only the track EQ settings and not the inserts? Thanks. All right, so once you're here, um, all right, so my son's getting restless. So once we come right over here, so let's say we have the EQ. Um, so in the EQ window, we could just come right over here and we'll see the preset management. So we'll say save preset uh, and we'll just call this January 21, 2022. So now all I had to do to kind of go to another, uh, let's say if I go to presets here, we could load presets and 
then we'll just see our January. So I could do that. And let's say the presets, so just kind of click right here on the channel presets. So you can say, okay, let's load our January 21st, 2022, and then that's our preset. So just kind of click right here in the channel EQ, and then you could save it as a preset. Uh, so one question, do you think uh, Cubase Elements 12 is going to have an increase in maximum tracks it can work with since the artist version now you can have no limitations on the number of tracks? Um, so I don't know, we'll just have to wait till Cubase, I, until Cubase 12 Elements is released. So we'll just have to kind of wait and see. All right, so we see Keith Young checking in. It's great to see you back. I think you just got back from your cruise ship gig. Um, I still can't get my head around configuration and workspace functions. Please explain if you haven't done so already. Just signed in a little late tonight. Thank you. So let's say I want to have, you know, a uh, I wanted to have a workspace that was one. Uh, just do it on a project here so we can see it. Um, All right, so I wanted a workspace that was gonna be kind of my full screen mixer. Okay, so we can think of this as like, just like a, almost like a snapshot of uh, our workspace. So I'm gonna come over here, let's add a workspace. So we'll say this is gonna be mixer. And we can make this a project workspace, which means it's only specifically for this project or global. So if we want it to be available in all projects. So we'll say, okay, this could be our mixer. And now I want it to go to uh, like the vocals. And let's come over here, let's hide this. And so now I just wanted to look at the vocal takes. So let's come here, let's add a workspace. I think we could even all right and let's say now I want to take this and do very audio on it and full screen we'll just make it Okay, so we'll do we'll add. Okay, so now if I just wanted to jump back to my mixer view, we could do that. If I wanted to jump back to, you know, seeing my vocal tracks, if I wanted to jump back to seeing um, you know, let's say, you know, so this would allow us just to kind of jump back. So let's say, uh, even in the workspace here, uh, I could say, okay, let's go to score editing. You know, th these are workspaces that were probably done across multiple screens as well. So I just want to see supervision kind of laid out. So you could just kind of save these different views of different windows so that you don't have to sit there and have multiple windows open and closed to kind of get to a specific working point. All right, so we see uh, Greg Derrida, you did a, this is from Jay from Connecticut. Thanks for joining the live stream.
Okay. Uh, it says Air Day did a great job of explaining how to set the DB level ranges to limit ceiling scope of faders. Uh, but is there a way to limit the floor from infinite to maybe minus 70? Um, so I don't know of a way, but usually between, you know, zero and minus 70 is pretty negligible. You know, it's, you know, so let's say if I come here, um, you know, like as we go down, it's, pro you know, so let's say if I come to, you know, so, you know, when we're in, in an audio event here, so I'll just blow this up. You know, we only go down. I think that the difference between like, you know, minus 70s, so I don't know a way to fix that. And there's probably a lot of people that wouldn't want to because they would want zero to always be like, you know, infinity to be at nothing. So, but I don't know a way to do that, but I think that the difference, you know, wouldn't kill anyone that, you know, it's not like, oh, it'd be number one if it, we could have fixed the bottom ceiling of the fader to minus 70, so. All right, uh, I heard, question, I heard that the USB e-licensing system will be abandoned with 12. What happens when I upgrade from 11 within a USB e-licensor? My version is applicable for the free upgrade. So basically, uh, when you uh, when it comes out, you'll see that you'll have a DAC code that will then render your uh, Cubase 11 license uh, it will be un you know, and that the DAC code that's going to be generated will be the upgrade into the new system with version 12, and then your license will transform your Cubase 11 license on your system will transform into a non-upgradable license because that license has been upgraded to version 12. So you can still use your version 11 with the e-licensor to run previous versions and then run version 12 and onward using the new Steinberg Activation Manager. All right, so we see, Greg, the advantage of 64-bit float over 32-bit float for acoustic and wind instruments or voiceovers with condenser mics, recording innuendo, Cubase, uh, 96K over 48K. Well, is it worth the large file size? You know, it's one of those things that you could try yourself pretty easily to see. Yeah, I think that the 64-bit to 32-bit floating point for the audio engine doesn't really increase the... Uh, you know, the doubling the processing precision doesn't really increase the file size, you know, 96K to 48K. Um, I know like some people, you know, I think one of the guys who was on the live stream previously would just, you know, like he was really almost obsessed with what uh, like DJ producer Zed, what sample rate he was using for his work because it sounded amazing. Uh, and then when I was talking to his camp, it was like, oh yeah, we just used 44.1, you know, so, um, so, I would, a lot of the, sometimes, you know, like my answer on sample rates are generally is, you know, if you, if it doesn't sound good, it's not the sample rates fault. Um, but, you know, but on like, if I was doing an Allison Krauss record, I would probably go 96K, um, you know, because it's like squeaky clean, uh, you know, perfect, you know, almost, you know, like acoustic stuff. But for a lot of the stuff, you may not, notice a huge difference but you know try it yourself and see what you what, what if it makes sense for your workflow all right so we have fj segovia checking in from madrid so i've been in madrid a few times i've been there a long time
All right, you see a nice comment from Jeff Sabelski saying, I'm very endlessly in awe and appreciative of two four-hour sessions a week with Greg and the rest of you from everywhere in the world. So, yeah, I think it's a wonderful community. Um, all right, so we see a comment from Frank says, uh, display an A sharp instead of B flat in the chord track would be a nice option. Uh, thank you again. So if you have a chord track, you could come over here if, um, so I think that the chords, like the, the scale, always shows an A-sharp, which is kind of annoying, and I've embarrassed some some people in our development team with that. Uh, you know, I was like, how do I get a B-flat in the scale? But you can change the chord itself. So if we come here and we activate, let's say, a chord track, and it, let's say you need to do an, an harmonic shift at that point, um, we go to the chord track and we'll drop the chord in. So let's say if we have it set to B flat, you could come over here and just, and you, you could see here, and it's kind of, you know, there's no real good explanation of why we type in a B flat chord and we see A sharp. Uh, but you could just do it. And if it shows up as A sharp in, in the chord and you want it to be B flat, just do the N harmonic shift right here. Okay, with that, we're just about out of time. I want to thank everyone for uh, all the wonderful questions. We should have the uh, we should have all of the uh, topics discussed today on the index later tonight, uh, and then then I could actually feel like I could start my weekend about ten o'clock on Friday night. Uh, but I want to thank everyone for participating and being a part of a wonderful community, and I want to. Uh, make sure that everyone stays safe and healthy. I've just been hearing too many people getting COVID, so I don't want anyone on the live stream to get COVID. So with that, we will go ahead and wrap up. Uh, please stay safe and healthy, and we'll see everyone on Tuesday.